think I have a pretty good grasp of the Bible and uh, how I teach it to my Sunday school class. Granted, I've been asked to step down a few times, but I mean, heresy is such a loose term these days. But I think if you put all the jigsaw pieces of the puzzle of the Bible together, I think I have a pretty good idea to teach anybody a little thing or two. Okay, so uh, share some of your knowledge with us. Okay, no problem on that one. Um, the Bible really doesn't get cooking until Moses built the ark. And the, wait, no, um, no, he was the one that parted the Red Sea. He was also the one that wrestled with God in the river of Gabok. And if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have been able to part that river too. But that was a foreshadowing. That was a prophecy for the New Testament when Luke would be in that river going, hey, I thought I could walk on water. And that was a foreshadowing of King Nebuchadnezzar telling King David, go get those people out of that water because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not belong there. And that is how King James became the greatest king of Israel. I believe in putting the words into action. You know what I mean? I mean, it's one thing to talk the talk. It's another one to walk the walk. All right? Case in point. I taught my kids the other day about David and Goliath, right? Now my youngest son, he's got mad skills with a slingshot. You know, I, I could tell you several stories of us, you know, putting the word into action. Uh, one of the most recent ones is I told my boys about, you know, Joseph and his brothers. And my oldest son, my oldest son, tried to sell his brother to the next door neighbor for a coat. My little entrepreneur, Bob was proud, and it was a nice coat. I'm a big fan of the Bible. I mean, who wouldn't be? It's in most hotel chains. I have one, probably two. I know I have a non-reading one in our living room. It's beautiful. It's right underneath our plaque that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm such a fan, I became a fan of the Bible on Facebook. Big fan. So, um, how often do you read the Bible? I'm a big fan. I don't see what the big deal is about, you know, memorizing scripture or carrying a big old clunky Bible everywhere. I mean, I have multiple translations of the Bible right here on my phone and on my digital reader, you know? And when I get to church, it's up on the screens. I don't really need to carry, I mean, carrying a big Bible anymore is just passe. Don't you think that having your own Bible helps you plant God's Word inside your heart? Really? So like, you know, thy word is a, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? You talking like Psalm 119, 113? I'm sorry, I, I guess you do know quite a bit of scripture on your own then. Nope. Just Google it. So this is my grandmother's Bible. She used to read to me out of this Bible when I was just a kid. She passed away this summer. A family member gave it to me because they knew I was a believer. To them, it was just a book. But to me, when I sit down and I read it, I see all her little notes. I see all the little highlighted pages, the dog-eared pages. I see the things that really meant something to her when God was speaking to her through his word. And I realize it's her legacy of faith that's passed on to me. That was passed from her parents to her. And you know what? It impacts my faith. More than anything, this truly is the living word. Good morning, everyone. Why don't you uh, stand up? We're going to praise together. Just one touch 
my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that a god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that a god can't do just one word what's broken inside me just one word and you revive every dream just one touch I feel the power of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that a god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that a god can't do there's nothing that a god can't do there's not a prison wall he can't Praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that a God can't do I will believe greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise, but all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus Let faith arise, let all agree There's no power like the power of Jesus I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like his power there's nothing that a God can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that a God can't do There's nothing that a God can't do There's not a prison wall he can't break through Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that a God can't do Give 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And pray. It's your breath on our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we Welcome back, Carrie. How was Alaska? Colder and rainy. <laughs> I think we're about oh, 40 degrees warmer here today than we were last Sunday. So, but it is absolutely beautiful. And if you can go to Alaska and still claim there's not a God, you don't have your eyes open because it is just, his creation is so beautiful up there. It is absolutely amazing, but it is cold. <laughs> Um, so we're finally kind of, we're back into this whole school thing, getting things kind of back to normal, back on schedule. Did all you guys start school this week? Pretty much. I know Hoopston and Cisna don't start until next week. So, but they'll get started here pretty soon. We got our college kids are getting ready to those that aren't already gone or leaving this week or starting this week, so getting back into things. So, and speaking of getting back into things tonight, quiz practice, teens and kids. Uh, teens at 4.30, kids at five. We got youth group at six o'clock tonight. Um, next Sunday, we're doing a messy youth group. And so we've got a messy games night, got some things planned for that. Um, and we're inviting the or the kids quizzers to come and join us for a little bit of that. So 
next week you want to send your kids in uh, clothes they can get messy in. Um, Ladies' Night is coming up August 30th, Wednesday night, 6.30. We're going to meet at Monocle's um, because I think Pueblo Lindo is going to be a lot busy again that night. So we're going to meet at Monocle's on the 30th. Uh, we will have child care available at the church for those who need it. So just let me know. Um, we'll have some people here for that to take care of the kids so that any of the moms that want to go are able to go. Um, Tuesday night Bible study will be starting next month. Not sure on a date yet, but we will let you know. But start getting prepared for that. Um, if you have questions, you can see Julie Burgess, and she can let you know about that. Um, we're going to have quiz meets coming up pretty soon. Our first teen quiz meet is September 9th in Lombard. Um, so we've got to drive for that one, but we're getting ramped up and ready to go for that. Um, I'd like to take just a minute before um, I end announcements and we go back to singing to just do, I know last week I had asked Jeremy to do a prayer over Olivia and Cameron because it was going to be their last week here before they went back to school, but I'd just like to do a prayer over all of our kids who are going back to school, um, who have just started back to school. And so if we could just bow our heads. Dear Lord, um, we know that you care and love and have created and have plans and expectations for every single one of these kids that we have in our care here at uh, Pax Nash Church. And we just pray that as we have kids going back to preschool and kindergarten and elementary school and kids starting in junior high and in high school, and we've got those who are going away to college and those who are staying home and going to college. We just have so many kids here and we just really want them to know and to feel your love as they go back to school, to feel your peace and your presence. We just ask that you watch over them, that you protect them from the things that they see and hear at schools. We ask that you give them wisdom to do the right thing and to show the world your love in the way that you want them to respond to others. We just ask that they have a safe and protected and successful um, school year this year, that they will learn the things that you want them to learn that they will be able to show your love to all of those around them, that they'll be able to stand firm and to be strong. And we just ask you to watch over them and protect them. We ask you to be with the teachers and the other school workers who are working with them. Help them to guide and protect and to just be there for them and to allow them to have the best school year they've ever had. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carrie. All right, let's stand up. Whoa, excuse me. Let's uh, stand on up. We're going to do the Battle Belongs today. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. All I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for can be against me
For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. And all I see are the ashes. You see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. Fight, I'll fight on my knees With my hands lifted high, oh God Battle belongs to you And every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the night, oh God The battle belongs to you Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. When I fight, I'll fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high, oh God. Battle me. You guys can have a seat. I'd like the kids to come on up for the kids corner today. Good morning. So I wanted to read to you guys a passage from John 8, 12. And it is when Jesus spoke again to a group of people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Have any of you guys ever had a time when you lost power? Have you ever lost power? And what happens when we lose power? Yeah. We're, weak. We're, we're weak. We feel scared. Do you feel scared when, you lose the, when the lights go out? No. No? Maybe some of us feel a little scared. Or maybe you feel surprised. Maybe you feel surprised. Maybe you're... I know I've had the power go out when I'm using the bathroom, and it's really dark in there when that happens. So in just a moment, I'll ask if the front lights could be turned off in just a moment. But what are some things... So what are some things, you can hold it, what are some things that we need light for? What do we need light for? Well, go ahead, Ryan. What do, we need, what do we need light for? We need light for power. What else do we need light for? We need light to have 
um, flowers grow in the plant? Well, yeah, that's what we need to help grow, but light is what we're talking about. You need to sit. So you feel scared whenever you lose power? So when we lose power, we get a little scared. What do we start looking for when we lose power? What's the first thing we do? What was that, Justice? What'd you say? What do we start looking for? What do your parents start looking for? Do you know? Maybe they start looking for their phone, a flashlight, or maybe a candle. Yeah. Yeah, they check the weather, or maybe they, maybe they go outside and they see what's going on. Okay. Audrey, let me have it. I'm going to hold it now. We couldn't share. No, nope, I'm going to hold it. No. No, you may not. Go ahead and sit. Audrey. So we're going to talk about how the light of the world. I want to show you guys something with the flashlight. Can I see the flashlight? No. What we're going to do is we're going to turn off the lights for a second. It is heavy. So we don't have all the lights off, so it's not so scary. But what happens when we turn on the light, the flashlight. What do we do? We start, we start looking for the light. We start looking for the light. So in, so when we look, when we look for the light, this is kind of symbolizing Jesus being the light of the world. And Jesus gave the light of the world to each of us. Now, what happens when I put a cup over it, um, where does the light go? Um, right here. <laughs> yeah, but do you see as much of that light? I can see better. No, no, you don't see as much. You can, you can still see some of it through the cup. That's fine, but it's not nearly as much as when you have that on. So let's pretend, hey, you wanna hold this cup? Let's pretend that that cup is, it's the darkness of sin. I tried to get a really big black cup, and it's got Diet Coke and Rogue One, a Star Wars story on it, so it's not saying that those are sinful or anything like that, but we're just going to pretend that that's symbolizing sin. I know you want the flashlight, but... There's flashlight. I want I know. Uh, okay, can I have the flashlight? No, I'm gonna have it. Because we're fighting. I want it. No. So if we take away the light, so let's just say everyone has the light of life with us. We go to church, but maybe we don't read our Bible. Can we see as much of the light? We can see some of it. Like if I just don't completely cover it. We can still see some of it. Yeah. Look up. We can still see. But maybe you don't read your Bible. Right, yeah. But then if you go to church and you don't read your Bible, and then maybe you're not nice to a friend. No, wait, There's even no. less light. Yeah, because darkness, because of the devil, darkness. Yeah. And God, because of the good kingdom. That's light. right. That's right. And then also, what was one of the first things that God made? He made the heaven and earth. And then he made, he saw that the earth was dark. And then he made light. And he said that light was good. 
So that's why we want light of the world. We know that Jesus is the light of the world and that each of us have the light of the world. And we need to let that be as bright as it can because look at all the darkness around here. Even if, go ahead and turn the lights back on. Even if we turn the lights on, there is darkness in this room still. Like there's shadows. Dark, what's, what's really sad? Yeah. There is always darkness somewhere. And that's kind of sad. But look how much light we can have if we have the light of the world because of Jesus. Yeah. That's true. There's, we don't like black holes either. <laughs> so before we go back, why don't we say a quick prayer? And then we've got some activities for light of the world back there, okay? So fold your hands and pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be the light of the world, to be the bread of life for us, and everything that he is, he is the almighty I am. Bless these kids as they start their routines again with school, as they learn new things, adjust to new things and just be with them at all times because that you are you are always with these kids and help them understand that as well in jesus name amen Thank you, guys. Hi, everybody. Thank you. It's good to be back. How many of you guys liked Jeremy last week? Glad you guys do. Oh... Anything exciting going on this week or last week? About the last two weeks that I didn't that I didn't catch. Anybody want? What? Moving? Where are you moving to? Why? <sighs> it's going to be a long commute to church. You know that, right? <laughs> oh, I want to. We're, we're going to miss you guys too. I know. You'll have to move right next door to the church down there. Nice. Nice. Oh, well, that's sad. We're going to miss you guys, but we'll pray for you during the transition for sure. Yeah. Good. Oh, well, there you go. That's awesome. Don't I need a house in Baxton? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, let's move on then, right? <laughs> We're going to continue our, our four-week series called Back to the Basics. It's a series about the basics and the foundations of our faith. If you were, if you were with us two weeks ago, you recall that we began uh, talking about the practice and consistency of, of bold prayer. Uh, and I want to let you know that I have consistently been praying for you guys and on those prayer cards that you handed in to me um, I've been praying over those every single day, uh, and I hope that you have seen maybe some, some movement in some of those areas as you have been praying over them as well. And if you haven't, I encourage you to keep praying because sometimes it's just God's timing and not ours. Uh, so last week I wasn't feeling well. Jeremy was with you. Right after Jeremy started preaching, actually, the Guinness World Records organization called me. Uh, and we made the record for the most times that stupid and moron were used in a single sermon. Um, and so, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love him. I really do. I love him. Uh, our discussion today is going to continue uh, with the Word of God, the Holy Bible. And it may seem like such an obviously important part of the Christian faith, and, 
Yet for some reason, the Bible is all too often overlooked or ignored in the, in the bustle and the hustle of our day. I think it's hustle and bustle, right? I said that backwards. Of our daily lives. Uh, so the, the simple truth is that the Bible is anything but unimportant. Uh, so as we learn today, the Word of God is living, it is active, and it is perfect for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training. Uh, and that's just kind of scratching the surface, too. The Bible's full of wisdom and surprises. Uh, the Bible consists of 66 smaller books divided into two major sections, the Old and the New Testament. That's pretty basic. So another way to think about it is that the Old Testament is everything that happened before Jesus and the New Testament. Uh, it covers about 70 years of time, including the birth and ministry of Jesus along with the beginning of the early church. Uh, so our, for our study today, we'll, we'll primarily be in the New Testament learning from Jesus and some of the, some of the original apostles too. Uh, another interesting fact is that the Bible is that it is all time best-selling book in the world, in the history of the world, ever has there been. And it has been translated into 724 different languages in its fullness. Uh, there's a lot more. There's like um, almost 5,000, I think, partially translated. Uh, but in its fullness, Old and New Testament, there's 724 different languages as of this year, which is the statistic I got. Bob, do you know anything differently? Not, okay, okay. So Bob is a Gideon, so I go to him for, for that information. Uh, and there is an entire ministry, like there's a lot of them actually, like Wycliffe Bible translators, that uh, their aim is to translate the Bible into every language on earth. Uh, so that is going to be, uh, it's quite the undertaking, um, but man, I really hope that, that we can get into that. So I think we would all agree that it's important for everybody on earth to have access to the Bible. Uh, not everybody has quick access like we do. We can go to our local bookstore or we can go on to the Amazon and uh, order uh, a Bible if we would like to and have it the same day or the next day. So have you ever, have you ever read the Bible, though, and something jumps out at you? Yeah? It's kind of like the Bible... Uh, knew what you needed at the moment? Or have you ever just kind of randomly opened to a passage that spoke so clearly to your life that it kind of freaked you out? Yeah. yeah. It, is, it, it, it works that way sometimes, and it's kind of, it's, it's very like, okay, what just happened? So if you've ever felt either of those things before, it was probably the Holy Spirit at work. And actually, the, the, the writer of Hebrews describes the words of, uh, of Scripture as both alive and active. Hebrews 4.12 in the NIV, it says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That one verse says an awful lot about scripture. But for starters, let's take a look at these two words, alive and active. The one verse, it's just full of really, really good information. So it says to be alive in this sense means to be counted among the living or not dead. That, that seems pretty obvious, right? The point being here that the writer of Hebrews very much counts the words of Scripture among the living just as other human beings are living just as animals are living. So the writer of Hebrews considers the Bible so much living that it's just as alive as a human being. So the word active means effective and productive in its work. For those of us in the room who've, who've been reading the Bible for, for some time, I think we can all agree that the Bible is both living and effective. So, so to drive the point home, the author of Hebrews says the word is more effective than a double-edged sword at dividing or cutting through soul and spirit. So the word is powerful and it's able to get down into the heart of the matter, even to the things that we may not even realize. It cuts through and it helps us and it helps reveal some of those things. 
So again, if you've ever read the Bible and it seems to be speaking directly into your situation, then I think it's fair to say that it probably was. And as we grow in our faith, it's important to, to continue returning to Scripture time and time and time and time again. We should never stop referring to Scripture. We need to submit ourselves to the Word of God in allowing the Spirit to work in and through our lives. So I know that to some that may sound kind of hokey and maybe too overly spiritual, but I'll, I'll tell you this, you need to try it. Try giving yourself a consistent time every day, just like we talked about having a consistent time to pray every day. Have a consistent time every day in Bible study and see for yourself just how powerful and effective the Word actually is. But you've got to be consistent. If you just do it every once in a while, you're not going to be able to hear God's voice on a regular basis. So I'm sure some of you here today understand the idea of something being profitable, right? More often than not, we speak of profitability like we're referring to financial gain or, or maybe a win. So interestingly, the word is also synonymous with the words beneficial and useful. So when the Apostle Paul is writing to the, to the young pastor Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, he tells him that all Scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is the NIV translation. Uh, the ESV says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So you, you may have noticed that one verse of the Scripture says useful and the other one says profitable. So the good news is that the Bible is both. Uh, and that, uh, if you add that to, to being living and active or effective in its, in its work, and the, the Bible is also great for teaching, rebuking, correction, and training in righteousness. So while I'm not going to go through each of these words today, I, I will say that these are very, very important words in the life of a disciple or a student as we continue to, to lean into Jesus and be more like him. So as we follow Jesus, we submit ourselves to his process, to his plan and his, his direction in our lives. Uh, that's the most important piece. So simply put, the Bible is profitable in the life of a disciple. So we need to be consistently, consistently reading scripture. And its profit is more than financial gain. It's spiritual gain. So following Jesus will cost you, but the value gained cannot be estimated. So Theologian uh, and pastor and, and an activist, actually, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said that costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. So we end up back at the feet of Jesus here. That's where it all begins and it ends for those of us that follow him. And that begins, uh, that kind of brings us to our most important point of today. And that the word is where you encounter Jesus because Jesus is the word. Here's where the entire conversation gets interesting. So uh, admittedly, Jesus often spoke in parables and, and stories that were sometimes really difficult and hard to understand, and, and it didn't, sometimes even the disciples didn't really know what he was getting at. So the original disciples actually routinely struggled with his messages that, that Jesus was sending, but it seems to me that the message I'm about to share with you is pretty clear. So listen to these words from John 1. It's 1 through 5 and then verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Interesting that we were talking about that, and Maria's message was similar. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. 
we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So verse 1 clearly states, um, it says that the Word was God in the beginning, and all things were made through the Word. There's life in the Word in verse 4. And the Word is the light of mankind. Then kind of the kicker is in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among mankind. I didn't even change that, did I? Cool. <laughs> verse 14 is a complete copy of verse 1 through 5. Uh, <laughs> well, you guys get the idea. Uh, but I don't think it could be clearer than the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. Is this why Scripture is living and active? I think so. Is this why sometimes I feel like when I'm reading the Bible and the Bible is actually reading me? I think it is. And I actually, I don't know if I can answer all these questions fully. I do know that God's ways are different from our ways. And I know Jesus says some other very interesting things in the Gospels that may be of interest. Let's look at John 6, 46 through 51. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So in this passage, and really throughout John 6, Jesus refers to himself as the living bread or the bread of life. When Jesus was, was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he says it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus knew that he didn't need another loaf of, of freshly baked French bread, right? What he needed and, and, and what we need is the very word of God, that living bread, the bread of life. There's other bread, of course, that may satisfy your earthly hunger, but there is truly nothing else that will cure your spiritual starvation. Only Jesus can do that. The Word made flesh, the bread of life, which is Scripture. The only way that we can really, really, really be cured of our spiritual issues is to consume that bread. So we need to be in Scripture every single day. So I believe it's vitally important in the life of a believer to be in the Bible. It's vital. There's nothing like it. No other book has ever been written, and I can probably guarantee that there is not another book in existence that we would consider alive and active. But I understand, too, that life gets complicated. Almost before you know it, your Bible reading plan is ruined. You're in the middle of reading a paragraph and something happens. Maybe your kid gets crazy and you forget to go back to it and your whole day is ruined. Or that devotional you bought to help give you some, some structure is nothing more than a permanent fixture on your coffee table. Just like the guy said in the video this morning, is the, the non-reading Bible. So today, instead of another bullet point plan, I'm just going to leave you with a few more words from Jesus. Many of you will be familiar with this as it's from the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus simply says, give us today our daily bread. And what if Jesus wasn't just talking about that French bread or, or where we would get our next meal? But what if he was talking about the bread of life? What if he was instructing, in the, instructing the disciples to pray for him? And what if God gave us daily access to Christ through Scripture? I think that would be an amazing way for God, our Father, to provide for all of his kids. 
So give it a try this week. That's your challenge. Keep praying. Pray about your thing. If you have a new thing, pray about it. And then get in the Word. Even if it's just for five minutes a day. Even if you just want to read a couple paragraphs, please give it a shot. And expect that you'll find the Bible is alive and it's active and it's useful and it's effective and it is very, very, very powerful. It will transform your life drastically. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for being the bread of life, giving us Jesus so that we could have access to you again and so that we could, we could really just know more about life and how we can get through it in the hard times and, and, and how we can celebrate in the good times. Lord, we love you so much, and I pray that you'll just be with us this week and prepare our hearts and our minds for, for leaning into Jesus, to becoming more familiar with him through the word, to learning more about ourselves in the process so that we can get better at, at worshiping you and, and, and living our life in a way that, that not only is, is better for us, but that can be a light to the world because we do live in a very dark world. And the only true light that can save humanity is Jesus. Thank you for it all. We give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Adam. All right, let's stand up and we're going to praise one more time. Oh uh-huh.
praise God, everyone. Have a great week. Have a great Sunday.